Hello and welcome back to The Fall of the Roman Empire. It's Nick Holmes and this is episode 77 called Nika. In the last episode, we left Justinian reeling from the news of Belisarius's defeat at Callinicum in April 531. The benefits of the great victory achieved at Dara the previous year had been undone, and the Persians had regained the initiative on Rome's eastern front. Added to this was rising discontent with John the Cappadocian's rapacious new tax regime and the apparent failure of Justinian's legal reform, which had stalled in 530 with a new legal code that was unworkable. Although we have very little detail about the political situation, there was certainly a segment of aristocratic Roman society which viewed Justinian as an upstart, just like his uncle Justin had been, a peasant with pretensions way above his station. And Justinian's wife Theodora only added to this sense of outrage. In short, many people wanted a regime change. Men like Anastasius's nephews, Hypatius and Pompeius, were widely seen as more deserving of imperial office than Justinian. So, unless Justinian could deliver some meaningful successes, discontent was going to simmer. And in late 531, that discontent was not just simmering, but beginning to boil. After Belisarius's defeat at Callinicum and his recall for a court-martial, the war in the east continued to be an embarrassment for Justinian. Things had returned to a stalemate until the Roman general Bessas launched a raid into Persian territory from the frontier fortress city of Martyropolis to regain the initiative. But this only provoked the Persian Shah Kavad to focus all the Persian forces on besieging the city. Three veteran Persian generals took command of the attack, Canaranges, Aspididis and Mermeries. It looked as if the city would fall, but Bessas maintained a brave defence, and Sitas, Belisarius's erstwhile companion from when they had both been imperial guards, and who'd also replaced him as Magister Militem per Oriens, took the main Roman army to a town called Atachas, about a hundred miles from Martyropolis to harass the besieging Persians. Martyropolis held out, but for how long? Procopius says Justinian was terrified it would fall and damage his reputation further, so he resorted to an espionage trick to save the city. Apparently, it was normal for spies to be everywhere in the Roman and Persian armies, and there were frequently double agents working for the highest bidder. One such was spying for the Persians in the Roman camp when he changed sides and sought an interview with Justinian himself. He told him the Persians were actively looking to buy an alliance with the European Huns for a combined attack through the Caucasus on Roman Syria. Justinian was understandably horrified by this news, but saw an opportunity to double-cross the Persians. He paid the spy a huge sum of money to return to the Persian forces outside Martyropolis and tell them that the Huns had been bribed by the Romans to join them instead. This caused considerable consternation for the Persians, who stopped their attack on the city and considered how best to respond to the possibility of a Hunnic onslaught. In addition, the Persians were distracted by the Shah Kavad's death in September 531. There was an immediate debate over who would succeed him. So the Persian army withdrew and Martyropolis was saved. Justinian had managed to avert another defeat, but he'd achieved nothing he could boast about. And in the cold days of January 532, people grumbled he was a bad emperor. The initial source of the trouble began with the circus factions, the Blues and the Greens, who dominated chariot racing in the Hippodrome. Chariot racing was the 6th century equivalent of modern football or baseball, 
As the church had banned gladiatorial contests, which of course had dominated classical Rome, so chariot racing, which had always been popular, took over. Charioteers were sporting superstars, for example, one named Porphyrius, who raced in the late 5th and early 6th centuries, was commemorated with statues and plinths, several of which have survived to this day. The blues and greens also had a large hooligan element in them. In Justinian's time, it seems this was growing. John Lydus, the chronicler who I mentioned in the last episode, had a particular aversion to the high taxation implemented by Justinian's chief finance minister, John the Cappadocian, or the foul Cappadocian, as he liked to call him, claimed there was an influx of migrants from Anatolia into the city who'd been bankrupted by the new tax regime. He referred to a growing underclass in Constantinople of, quote, useless mobs. But another view is that this influx of migrants owed more to a strong economy, with people flocking to Constantinople to seek jobs and better prospects. I think that sounds more likely, and we'll return to the subject of why the Eastern Empire's economy was booming in the first half of the 6th century in later episodes. Certainly by 532, Constantinople was an enormous city by late antique standards, perhaps the largest in the world, probably with over 600,000 inhabitants. It and the other major cities in the empire, like Antioch and Alexandria, were also increasingly dominated by the circus factions, which were becoming ever more violent and intrusive into politics. And these circus factions were also only too willing to be manipulated. Justinian himself had courted favour with the Blues during Justin's reign to gain popularity. As I mentioned in episode 73, he'd spent a fortune when he was made consul, paying for entertainment in the Hippodrome, not just chariot racing, but also animal fights and lewd pantomime shows, which were particularly popular. Indeed, he and Theodora probably met at a function organised by the Blues, with whom she was also closely associated. But when he became emperor... Justinian didn't see the need to court favour with the Blues. The same was true of Theodora when she became Empress. Indeed, one senses both of them wanted to turn their backs on these odious organisations. Both Blues and Greens felt offended by this. As I mentioned in the last episode, towards the end of 531, the Greens in particular started to taunt Justinian with chants of wood that Justinian had not been born. A few years before, the Blues might have tried to silence them, but now they didn't. The trouble began on the 10th of January, 532, when seven circus faction members, a mix of Blues and Greens, were sentenced to death for murder. Transported by boat across the Golden Horn to the suburb of Sikai, which is modern Galata, they were hanged, but the scaffold broke, and two of them, one green and one blue, miraculously survived and fled to a nearby church for sanctuary, where the urban prefect, Eudaemon, dared not send troops to arrest them on sacred ground. Three days later, on the 13th of January, a new series of races began in the Hippodrome, presided over by Justinian. Both Greens and Blues chanted appeals to him for the two survivors to be allowed to live. But Justinian chose to ignore them. By the end of the day, the mob was getting impatient, using a new slogan, Nika, meaning victory, the war cry of the Roman army. They started to riot. Their first destination was the headquarters of the urban prefect called the Praetorium, a building which included the main city prison and administrative offices. They broke into it, released the prisoners and then burnt it down. Despite this outrageous behaviour, the next day, on the 14th of January, Justinian allowed the second day of races to continue. But the mob had scented blood. 
and wouldn't be appeased. They started burning down the upper tiers of the Hippodrome. The blaze got out of control and spread to the baths of Zeusippus, which contained many famous statues from antiquity. These were all destroyed. Justinian and his ministers were shocked by how this disturbance was getting out of hand. They didn't know how to respond, since it wasn't clear what the rioters wanted. The two condemned murderers had been rescued by the mob. One source says that Justinian was told, probably by Theodora, that he needed to listen to their demands. So, three high-ranking officials, including the General Mundo, were sent from the palace to speak to them. The mob responded by demanding the resignation of Justinian's main ministers, starting with Eudaemon, the city prefect, who'd originally refused to release the two condemned men, and also John the Cappadocian. More mysteriously, they also wanted to sack Tribonian, the barrister working on Justinian's legal reforms. This was mysterious because he wasn't a well-known member of the administration, so the call for his dismissal probably indicates a growing senatorial involvement. Justinian's legal reform was in its early stages and would have been largely unknown to most ordinary citizens. But in the Senate, it was a main talking point, with many conservative senators suspicious of Justinian's true intentions and sensing a betrayal of traditional Roman values. For example, the bureaucrat John Lydus even disliked the idea of issuing new laws in Greek instead of Latin, which was what Justinian was proposing, since this would be a betrayal of Rome's traditional focus on using Latin for all legal and administrative business. Justinian was alert to the danger of mob violence turning into a call for regime change, so he gave way to the rioters and dismissed all three of his top ministers. But it seems what he feared most was a coup in the palace itself. This was a possibility since Procopius says the palace guard didn't back Justinian and were waiting to see if rivals made a bid for power. To prevent this, he sent home Anastasius's nephews, Hypatius and Pompey. However, Justinian did have one supporter, Belisarius. He'd returned from the east to face the court of inquiry into his defeat at Callinicum, although the fact he had a group of his best troops with him suggests he'd been pardoned. It's at this point that our three main sources on the Nika riots diverge. Melalus describes Justinian ordering Belisarius to restore order with his troops. According to him, on Friday the 15th of January, Belisarius's soldiers killed many of the rioters protesting in front of the imperial palace, which, he says, only made matters worse and encouraged the mob to call for a new emperor. Although Belisarius might have tried to stop the mob from attacking the palace, I don't think there was any large-scale fighting since two days later on Sunday the 17th of January, another chronicler, Pascal, says Justinian made a last appeal to the mob by going to the Hippodrome, standing in the imperial box or cathisma, and in front of a vast crowd who'd gathered specifically to hear him, he offered to pardon all the rioters under oath. Quote, by this power, i.e. holding the Bible, I forgive you this error, and I order that none of you be arrested, but be peaceful, for there's nothing on your head, but rather on mine. For my sins have made me deny to you what you asked of me in the Hippodrome, i.e. the release of the convicted murderers. End quote. This was an extraordinary capitulation by the proud Justinian. He was, in effect, telling the mob, the problem is me, not you. Although not mentioned by Procopius, I suspect it's true, and Justinian was copying a famous incident which you may recall from episode 72 when the Emperor Anastasius had made a similar appeal to the mob before a packed hippodrome. On that occasion, in a truly remarkable display of oratorical skill, 
Anastasius had taken the imperial diadem from his head and told the crowd he would abdicate if they wished, but he wanted them first to listen to what he had to say. Unfortunately, we have no record of his words, but by the end of his speech, the crowd was begging him to return the crown to his head and calling out, Anastasius, may you be victorious. There's no indication that he bribed the rioters or even promised to renounce his pro-monophysite views. We can only assume that he pleaded for common sense to prevail over what was in that instance a religious dispute, and his humility and eloquence won the day. Twenty years later, Justinian tried the same technique. On that cold January morning, he must have been hoping he could work Anastasius's magic. He was no doubt hoping to defuse the insurrection with a few choice words. Unfortunately, the mob had a few choice words for him. Although some of the blue supporters shouted out their support, a chant quickly took hold in the Hippodrome, saying, You are a stuffed ass. Before long, the entire Hippodrome was shouting out this humiliating put-down. Justinian nervously exited the Cathisma, probably hoping not to trip up as he walked back down the steps into the palace, since the Hippodrome was located exactly adjacent to the palace and the two were connected with numerous passageways and staircases. Back inside the palace, he had one thought to run for it. It's at this point that Procopius's narrative becomes the most detailed of our sources, either because he was there at the time, or he heard an account from Belisarius, who was definitely there. As so often with Procopius, one senses a wicked sense of humour and a profound dislike of Justinian, for he describes an almost laughable scene of panic in the palace. Justinian wanted to flee the capital but it was his brave wife, Theodora, who took control. Procopius records a long speech in which she apologised for speaking up as a woman. Quote, As to the belief that a woman ought not to be daring among men or to assert herself boldly among those who are holding back from fear, I consider that the present crisis most certainly does not permit us to discuss whether the matter should be regarded in this or in some other way. In other words, she was saying, it's not a woman who should be saying this, but we don't have much time, so I'm going to do it. She admonished her husband for wanting to run away, saying, on the one hand, she knew he could easily escape, quote, If now it is your wish to save yourself, O Emperor, there's no difficulty, for we have much money, and there is the sea, and here are the boats, end quote. We can just imagine her pointing to the ships moored in the palace's own private harbour. But she then reminded him of the ignominy of flight. Quote, However, consider whether it will not come about after you've saved yourself that you would gladly exchange that safety for death. For as for myself, I approve a certain ancient saying that purple makes a fine burial shroud. End quote. I doubt Theodora really delivered the speech, but my sense is that it was the feisty Theodora who forced Justinian to stay and fight. Meanwhile, the senators who opposed Justinian had found a new emperor. This was Hypatius, Anastasius's nephew. As I mentioned, fearing a palace coup, Justinian had sent him home. But this only made matters worse because the mob went to Hypatius's house and together with Pompeius, Anastasius's other nephew, they escorted him to the Forum of Constantine where he was crowned emperor with a golden necklace on his head, the best substitute that could be found for the imperial diadem. Procopius says Hypatius's wife Mary, a very sensible woman according to him, begged the mob not to take her husband, for she knew this would end in disaster, but she couldn't stop them dragging him away. 
Whether Hypatius was a willing accomplice remains a moot point. Procopius suggests he overcame his initial hesitation to join the rebels, but Pascal claims he was playing a double game all along, according to him, when he was seated by the mob in the Cathisma in the Hippodrome. He secretly sent a messenger to the palace, telling Justinian that he'd lured his enemies into the Hippodrome where he could now slaughter them. Again, according to Pascal, unfortunately for Hypatius, there was a misunderstanding and a messenger reported back that Justinian had fled the capital. The rebellious senators debated what to do next. Should they storm the palace or wait for Justinian to flee? Procopius, says a senator, Origenes, argued it would be too dangerous to march on the palace and they should wait for Justinian to flee. But they hadn't expected Theodora's rallying call, as I described, for back in the palace with his wife urging him to fight, Justinian turned to the only man who could save him. This was, of course, Belisarius. So with Theodora pushing him on, Justinian unleashed the best general in the empire, on his critics who wanted to dethrone him. A plan was quickly devised, probably thought up by Belisarius himself, to sow discord between the Blues and Greens by having an Armenian officer, Narses, who'd recently defected from the Persians and would play a major role in the Italian wars years later, so we'll hear a lot more about him, to slip out of the palace and bribe members of the Blue faction. Narcisse was helped by Mundo, the general commanding the Haruli federate soldiers, who also happened to be in the capital. But Narcisse's and Mundo's activities were just a diversionary tactic, designed to distract attention from the main assault led by Belisarius and directed against Hypatius. First, Belisarius tried to break into the Cathisma directly from the palace and seize Hypatius, but his path was blocked by guardsmen unwilling to take sides for or against Justinian. According to Procopius, Belisarius returned to the palace and asked Justinian if he wanted him to continue with his aim of capturing Hypatius. I think he asked this question because it was clear it would mean taking on the mob and killing many of them. Justinian said yes. So, yet again, it was Belisarius who saved the day. He led his loyal troops through the bronze gate from the palace and into the northern colonnade of the Hippodrome via the destroyed remains of the baths of Zeusippus and the Propylaea. There he met a huge group of rioters. It was impossible to get to Hypatius in the Cathisma without dispersing them. We don't know how many soldiers Belisarius had with him. I suspect it was only a few hundred. But Belisarius's men were veterans of war, trained killers who defeated the Persian immortals at the Battle of Dara. A mob of civilians couldn't hope to survive their onslaught, even if many of the young men in the circus factions thought of themselves as tough. Belisarius drew his sword and commanded his soldiers to do the same, and they charged into the mob. Procopius says 30,000 died that afternoon. It was an unbelievably huge number, about 5% of the entire population of the city of some 600,000. The Hippodrome must have been drenched in blood and gore. As the mob panicked and fled, Belisarius finally reached the Cathisma and seized both Hypatius and Pompeius. He brought them back to Justinian. They wept and pleaded that they'd been coerced against their will to rebel. The next day, on Monday the 19th of January, they were executed. Their bodies were flung to rot in the sea. Justinian arrested those senators who'd led the revolt, although we have almost no details about them. Procopius, writing 20 years after the event, clearly thought it unwise to raise such a sensitive subject. The Nika riots came to within an inch of overthrowing Justinian. They reveal much about his 
inability to rule effectively. First, he completely failed to emulate his predecessor Anastasius, who displayed such courage and charisma in talking the mob down. Second, it was Theodora who persuaded him not to flee. Without her, he would have forfeited his imperial dignity. Third, it was Belisarius who saved the day. He stormed the Hippodrome and didn't flinch from perpetrating the greatest slaughter of civilians in Roman history to save his master. Without Belisarius, Justinian would have become just another footnote in the history books. And that ends this episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. And in the next episode, which will be in two weeks' time on the 17th of February, we'll continue with Justinian and Belisarius. And in the meantime, please do leave a review if you like the podcast and do also check out my website, nickholmesauthor.com. Link in the show notes to find maps, blogs and a free ebook. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Mm-hmm.